Hello and welcome to the chapter 21 lecture on the miscellaneous bacterial agents of disease. In this particular chapter, we will cover the spirochetes as our major group, and we'll also talk about some of the other uh, non-typical uh, bacterial forms, such as those that lack their cell walls, like mycoplasma, uh, which causes a form of pneumonia. So pathogens that don't fit typically into the gram-positive or gram-negative groups are the topic of discussion for this particular section. Uh, this includes not only the spirochetes and the curved bacteria, but also uh, the obligate intracellular parasites and the bacteria that lack their cell walls, like the mycoplasma. Uh, table 21.1 in your book does walk through, as in previous disease chapters, the disease and the body profile in terms of what disease and what system is impacted. So we're going to start overall talking about the spirochete group first. The spirochetes are these really thin, uh, coiled cells. They have this kind of wavy appearance to them. Uh, they do have an endoflagella, meaning that the flagella actually runs through uh, the length of the cell. They are typically found in places in the body, such as the oral cavity, the intestinal tract, and the genital regions of both humans and animals. So mammalian hosts are the typical uh, host pathway. And these are pathogens that are also strict parasites with really complex growth requirements. They often, most times you'll see, require uh, micro aerophilic conditions, and they also need to be grown on very enriched types of laboratory media. They can also be grown and cultivated in live cells um, in vivo as well. So we're going to start with the first group of the syphilis family, the treponema. Uh, these are, again, pathogens that are strict parasites. They are requiring very complex growth conditions. And um, we're going to get in and talk specifically about syphilis which is the uh, form of this family that requires humans as the natural host. Um, as we've already said, it's extremely fastidious, doesn't survive well outside of the host for a long period of time, and uh, syphilis has a not only a sexual transmission, but also uh, can be transplacental as well. This is a series of the different stages of syphilis, table 21.1 from your text, including uh, the various stages of the disease, the duration of the disease, and the typical symptoms that are seen at each of these. So we are going to get uh, further into these in a few moments. So primary syphilis, this is where the spirochete binds to uh, the epithelial cells, it begins the process of multiplication and creates this uh, lesion or ulcer uh, called a canker at the site of the microbes inoculation. So it's commonly places like the mouth and the genital region. Uh, the canker has really firm margins with a uh, kind of liquid, liquefied center to it. The fluid from that center of the canker is extremely contagious, and the canker will actually spontaneously heal um, when the microbe moves from the localized canker site into the bloodstream. Secondary syphilis, on the other hand, is now where we've converted over to uh, the bacteria actually multiplying within the bloodstream, we do have the characteristic symptom of the presence of this red to brown colored rash that forms on the skin, the palms and the soles of the feet, and also the presence of a fever, headache, and sore throat. The rash itself doesn't hurt or itch uh, and can persist for very long durations. We also have cases of lymphadenopathy uh, that occur during this particular stage as well. 
we can then go into what's known as tertiary syphilis, and this is where uh, most of the irreversible damage from the disease occurs if it's left untreated. So about 30% of all infections will enter a latent period that can last for uh, some duration, you know, up to 20 years or so. The um, tertiary form creates these rubbery masses on the tissues, which are known as gumas. And these gumas um, have this kind of plasticky looking appearance to them. Um, I also do want to say that in terms of seeing these uh, syphilis under the microscope, we often use the dark field microscope to be able to view them and, and be able to get that contrast. During the latency period, so when this uh, organism is dormant within the body, the only way to test to determine if the microbe is present is through serological testing of the blood. We also talk about congenital syphilis, and this is where syphilis is able to pass uh, through the placenta and into the fetus, and it's possible during any of the three stages, so it's not more likely in one stage versus the other. Symptoms will include things like nasal discharge, bone deformation, and nervous system abnormalities. Um, we also see stigmatisms in the bone and eyes, the inner ear and the joints and also the presence of this symptom known as Hutchinson's teeth, where the teeth actually get this uh, notched barrel-shaped appearance to them. So Hutchinson's teeth is a major symptom of this congenital syphilis period. So here's an example of these Hutchinson's teeth where the teeth become kind of notched and barrel-shaped. Um, the stages of syphilis can mimic several other diseases, other STDs or STIs, um, can even complicate the diagnosis. We've already mentioned some of the uh, serological testing during the latent period, looking at the blood. Microscopy, we've talked about the dark field microscope as the common microscopy method. There are also staining techniques uh, that use silver to make the spirochetes more visible when they're under the bright field microscope. And the treatment here is often penicillin. There are some other non-syphilitic uh, treponematosis, such as Vigil, Yaws, and Penta. Um, these differ from common syphilis because uh, syphilis, as you remember, is sexually transmitted. So that is um, one of the big differences um, between the three. Also, when we talk about Yaws, Pinta, and Begel, these are very slow, progressive skin diseases that start at the superficial level and then work their way down into the deeper layers of the skin. So here's some examples of the pictures of these non-syphilitic forms. We move into our second group, which are the leptospira, and these cause a disease known as leptospirosis. The leptospira are these coiled cells that either bend or hook at one or both of their ends. And there's only two species that we know of currently in this genera. Um, Leptospira biflexa, which is a very harmless, free-living form. And the one that we're going to be uh, discussing, Leptospira interrogans, causes this disease, the leptospirosis. And this is zoonotic. And it's acquired through contact with contaminated animal urine. So the bacteria are actually shed in the urine. And the infection to humans occurs when it's contacted, that infected urine is contacted with organs such as the eyes, the liver, the brain, and the kidneys. The symptoms include uh, a sudden, sudden high fever, chills, muscle aches, uh, an inflammation of the conjunctiva, and vomiting. Um, the long-term infections may actually cause damage to the kidneys and the liver. And it's extremely 
rare, about 50 to 60 cases in the U.S. each year. Most of the infections are mild and self-limiting, meaning that there really isn't going to be a severe uh, disease. We're going to see kind of some of these generic symptoms here, the fever and the chills and the headache and the infection will eventually go away with very little treatment. There is a uh, possibility for vaccination, especially for high-risk individuals like veterinarians. Uh, tetracycline is often given um, to protect these workers from contracting the disease. Um, I also do want to mention um, Wales syndrome, which is uh, usually a, a condition that occurs during the second phase um, of the disease. So whale syndrome is also important to be aware of. Um, Borrelia, which is our next member of this particular family, is responsible for Lyme disease. And as Connecticut residents, we've often heard Lyme disease uh, quite a bit. These are large spirochetes. They are uh, irregularly spaced, kind of loose coiled. Um, you don't have that really fine wavy appearance. This is more of kind of a looser coil appearance to the cell. And there's uh, two big forms that we're going to discuss. There's Borrelia hermsii, which causes a disease known as relapsing fever, and Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease. These are all transmitted through an arthropod vector being the tick. And um, we'll talk about the uh, different ticks that are responsible for this disease transmission. Borrelia hermsii, or relapsing fever, is commonly associated with wild uh, mammal reservoirs, things like squirrels and chipmunks. The transmission occurs through soft-bodied ticks. And the initial symptoms usually include things like headache, fever, and fatigue. Um, it is incredibly relevant for campers or other outdoor personnel who are working in wooded areas to uh, be cognizant and vigilant about transmission of this disease. The, the, the later stages of the symptoms include things like nausea, vomiting, muscle aches, abdominal pain, damage to many of the vital organs. But the fever and the reason why it's known as relapsing fever is the um, organism actually goes through something known as antigenic shift. And this is where it's able to change the antigens displayed on the surface of the cell. So as the antigens change, the immune system takes time to basically catch up and respond to the pathogen. So in those periods where the pathogen is shifting, the, you're going to see large um, changes in the body temperature. So you're going to get these fever spikes that occur. When the immune system catches up and is able to combat the pathogenic agent, the fever decreases and goes away until the pathogen again shifts its antigens on its cell surface, allowing the fever to spike again. So you get this period of these fluctuations of fever that occur. So again, here's uh, an example of what I was just talking about. So pathogen starts to cause the fever, body temperature rises, the immune system catches up, causes the, um, you know, the fever to decrease through the antibody generation. The pathogen then again shifts its antigens on its cell surface, allowing the symptoms to reemerge until the immune system is then able to catch up. And this, this fluctuating or relapsing fever occurs over time. So the primary infection induces this high fever. After the initial antibody response, so once the immune system is able to generate the B cells and eventually the antibodies, the fever reduces. And then again, that as that antigen process shifts, the relapsing fever comes back again until the immune system is able to generate a reaction to that second antigen. 
We're also going to talk about Borrelia burgdorferi, which uh, causes Lyme disease. And this is a process that is um, usually associated with animals, things like the white-footed mouse and the deer. Um, the transmission involves uh, multiple members in its pathway, including uh, the tick, which is known as Ixodes scapulari, and the white-footed mouse, as well as the deer. So how does this process work? What is the life cycle of Lyme disease? Well, the newly hatched larvae become infected when they feed on small animals. So we're talking about the tick, such as mice. And the mice may harbor those spirochetes. So the uh, ticks will acquire the spirochete and continue to develop. Now, if we shift to the second year, the larvae will now molt into what's known as the lymph stage. And this is where they become uh, ready to aggressively feed on different hosts. So that nymph stage is now going to start to take a number of blood meals from different hosts, including deer and humans. And it's on the deer where the nymph stage matures to the adult stage. And the adult males and females then go through the mating process. Um, and once the female lays their eggs, they are going to hatch and begin the cycle over again. So humans are not the normal host for the tick. It's things like the uh, mouse and the deer that serve as those, uh, those host stages. It is a non-fatal disease. However, it is a slowly progressive syndrome that has some neuromuscular and arthritic uh, complications to it. So there's several stages of the disease. The first stage is noted by the presence of a bullseye rash in the majority of patients, known as erythema migrans. The secondary stage is characterized by symptoms such as fever, headache, stiff neck, and dizziness. And in the third stage, or the tertiary stage, we now start to see cardiac, and uh, neurological symptoms, as well as arthritis um, as a, a common symptom. So here again is a uh, tick that has been engorged after a blood meal. And we also have the presence of that infectious bullseye rash uh, known as the erythema migrans. We also talk a lot about the um, curviform bacteria, which are actually gram-negative. And they fall into three basic groups, the Vibrio, the Campylobacter, and the Helicobacter. And all three members of this group have the ability to survive and pass through the intestinal tract. We'll talk about how they do so for each type in a few moments. So Vibrio cholerae is a comma-shaped bacteria, has this kind of curved appearance to it. I had one of my students once that told me it looked like a cheese doodle. Um, if you've ever eaten those kind of orange, I guess they're chips, they're buffed kind of uh, uh, things that you would find in the chip aisle at the grocery store. They are fermentative and they grow on selective media that contains bile. So they do have some specific growth conditions to them. They do possess several antigens, such as the, uh, the O or cell wall antigen and the H uh, antigen or the flagella antigen, and they cause a disease known as cholera. And cholera presents as a severe form of diarrhea. And the diarrhea is a result of the presence of an endotoxin, or ectotoxin, excuse me, known as an AB form toxin. So remember that we have the active portion or the A portion of the toxin, which actually causes the damage. And we also have the B portion or the binding portion, which allows the toxin to attach. Um, 
It has been a uh, pandemic pattern since about 1961. And in non-endemic areas, it can be spread by ingestion of fecal contaminated food or water. And it really has a specific uh, process to it in that it is going to attach to the surface of your intestinal epithelial cells. And once it attaches to the surface of those epithelial cells, it's going to then produce that AB exotoxin. And what the exotoxin does is it causes your epithelial cells to secrete chloride ions. And if you remember in our discussion of osmosis, it, uh, the, the movement of water is going to follow the concentration of ions. So as those ions are secreted, those chlorine ions are secreted from your epithelial cells, water is also going to follow the ions. And it's going to generate this uh, characteristic disease symptom known as rice water stool. And rice water stool is this, um, you know, bloody, stringy, mucousy dysentery that forms um, as a result of the disease. The resulting dehydration can also cause a series of other symptoms, things like sunken eyes, thirst hypotension and shock are also other common uh, circulatory neurological and muscular symptoms that result from uh, infection by cholera um, we also talk a lot about dysbiosis and dysbiosis is really this imbalance of intestinal conditions that occur as a result of um, these these intestinal infections that disrupt the balance of the intestinal tract. So treatment is often done through uh, what we know as oral rehydration therapy. And the oral rehydration therapy is basically reestablishing not only the water that the body has lost uh, to help increase the blood volume, but it also reestablishes uh, essential electrolytes for survival as well. So again, we've talked about the basic target of pathogenesis, what this exotoxin is doing. Again, it's causing the um, epithelial layer in the intestine to release ions, key ions like chlorine ions. And as those ions are secreted out of the epithelial layer, water is going to follow that concentration as well, causing that dehydration to occur. So this is all a result of that AB exotoxin that's present with cholera. So we do have some other members of the Vibrio family that are not as pathogenic as Vibrio cholerae. Uh, we have one that's known as Vibrio parahemolyticus. And this causes a uh, gastroenteritis, and it's acquired from raw seafood, uh, such as oysters. And the symptoms are very similar to cholera, uh, treatment through fluid and electrolyte replacement uh, due to the loss of key ions, but also uh, water that's secreted. And then we also have uh, Vibrio vulnificus, which also is a gastroenteritis from raw oysters. And it does have complications for folks who are uh, diabetics or have liver disease. Uh, Vibrio vulnificus produces a uh, homolysin that actually is able to lyse the red blood cells. And upon lysing the red blood cells actually causes the release of hemoglobin. Now, when the hemoglobin is released, you remember that one of the key structural components of hemoglobin is iron. So when iron is released, there are these uh, molecules called siderophores that are actually sequestering and collecting that ion, uh, the iron, excuse me, for the Vibrio cells to utilize. We also talk a lot about the Campylobacter genus, and these are often S-shaped, um, bacilli-shaped kind of uh, cells and they do have polar flagella, and we find them associated with the uh, gastrointestinal tract. 
Um, they do require microaerophilic conditions, so they require very little oxygen. And the most important ones that we know of are Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter fetus. We are going to spend most of our time talking about the first one here, this Campylobacter jejuni. It is the cause of bacterial gastroenteritis transmitted through food and beverage. And what they do is they actually reach the intestinal mucosa at the final stages of the small intestine. And they adhere and burrow into the mucus layer. And when they do this, they release an enterotoxin known as the CJT toxin. And this simulates a secretory diarrhea like cholera, where you are losing water and electrolytes. So you're going to see the common symptoms that we also saw with Vibrio, things like headache, fever, abdominal pain, but also that dysentery, that bloody and watery diarrhea that is going to be shed due to the effects of the enterotoxin CJT. Treatment includes the oral rehydration therapy and antibiotics, and there is no current vaccine available. So prevention really depends on uh, a few different things, including uh, the pasteurization of milk, careful handling of food supplies during food preparation. And we also often see uh, the presence of a uh, secondary uh, sequelae that occurs as a result of infection with Campylobacter jejuni, and we call this wheelan barr syndrome. So that is important to know that that is kind of a long-term sequelae that results from infection. Campylobacter fetus is traditionally of interest to veterinarians um, because it's an STD with sheep, cattle, and goats. And it does cause abortion in these animals, which has a, a great economic impact on the livestock industry. In humans, however, it's an opportunist. And it infects uh, people who are debilitated, but also women who are late in pregnancy. And they get symptoms that are very similar to meningitis, pneumonia, arthritis, and uh, septicemia um, when it's transmitted to the newborn baby. Helicobacter pylori is one that we see a lot with the stomach. And it's significant because we don't have very many, if at all, microbes that are able to colonize the stomach because of the very low pH acidic conditions. Um, these are curved cells that were discovered in 1979 during biopsy of stomach samples. And they cause about 90% of all stomach and duodenal ulcers, but are also a uh, cofactor in stomach cancers as well. People with the O blood type have about a one and a half to two time higher rate of the ulcers. And the key uh, virulence factor here is the presence of this urease enzyme. And this is the factor that allows the uh, helicobacter to survive the stomach environment that urease enzyme converts urea into ammonium and bicarbonate. And it's the ammonium and the bicarbonate that cause the stomach conditions to become more alkaline, allowing the bacteria to be able to burrow its way into the uh, stomach and cause the infection to occur. Common symptoms with Helicobacter pylori include things like vomiting, abdominal pain, Belching uh, or burping uh, are common symptoms as well. We also talk a lot about uh, our next group, which are the medically important bacteria that have a very unique morphology to them. And we talk about the rickettsias, the chlamydias, and the mycoplasma. So when we talk about the rickettsias, we're talking about and chlamydias, we're talking about intracellular pathogens. So they require a host cell for their function. And rickettsia is transmitted through an arthropod vector, 
Chlamydia does have two forms that are able to alternate, known as the elementary and the reticulate bodies. The mycoplasmas, on the other hand, are the group that lack their cell walls. So we'll talk about that one in a little bit. And mycoplasma causes atypical pneumonia, very different symptoms from the pneumococcal pneumonia, but uh, also does have some community acquisition. So let's talk about the rickettsias first. These are gram-negative in terms of their cell wall, so they have a thin peptidoglycan layer. They are pleomorphic, meaning that they can vary their shapes between rods or shortened rods, known as cocobacilli. And these are intracellular parasites that are acquired through a vector, such as ticks, fleas, or lice. And the bacteria are able to enter the endothelial cells and cause a damage to the vascular lining. So this causes things like vasculitis or an inflammation of the, uh, the vascular pathway, leakage, and also thrombosis. So we talk about and break these down into different groups. We have the typhus group, which is known as either the epidemic typhus or the endemic typhus. Epidemic typhus is carried by lice and starts with high fever, chills, headache, and rash. Uh, the Brill zincer is the common chronic recurrent form of epidemic typhus. The endemic typhus is harbored in mice and rats and is much more sporadic um, and has, again, milder symptoms. The one that's the most important is this one here, the spotted fever or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is caused by rickettsia rickettsii, and it's zoonotic. Very high prevalence along the east coast or eastern seaboard, uh, also the southeast, and it causes this distinctive spotted rash. And it starts on the hands and the feet and works its way to the rest of the body. The disease may cause damage if untreated to the heart and the central nervous system, but the initial symptoms are often fever, chills, headache, and of course, and of course, the spotted rash. We also have scrub typhus, and the last two, which are known as uh, ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis, are also tick-borne infections. They attack your monocytes or your granulocytes, and uh, they cause symptoms such as chills, headache, muscle pain, rash, and lethargy. Um, antibiotic treatment works. So this is Table 21.2, summarizes many of the diseases uh, that we have currently talked about for the rickettsia. So we've talked about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, most common uh, rickettsial infection, and again, affecting the eastern seaboard, also the southeast portions of the United States, transmitted through a tick bite. Um, again, the tick bite, once it occurs on the humans, it targets uh, vascular damage. We get the presence of the spotted rash, and if left untreated, can actually result in central nervous system damage. We have Coxiella burnetii, which results in a condition known as Q fever. And Q fever is a zoonosis, and it's spread from unpasteurized milk, and it also can be an airborne infection as well. The pathogen produces resistant spores and overall, the symptoms include things like fever, muscle aches, and rash. Bartonella henselae, um, which is going to be one of the big ones that we talk about here, causes something known as cat scratch fever or cat scratch disease. These are small, gram-negative, uh, fastidious microorganisms, very similar to the rickettsia family. Uh, and we'll talk about Alto Bartonella quintana, which causes something known as trench fever, and this is spread by lice. 
So here's our, our Bartonella genus that we're going to get into, and we're going to look very specifically at these um, scarring um, lesions that form on the surface of the skin. Um, one thing I do want to say is with the Bartonella genus, the cat scratch fever, um, when the cats do scratch, they do have microbes that are trapped in the nail beds uh, around their claws. And you often get this severe inflammation, swelling, and the production of this kind of hard scab-like region on the surface of the skin. We also talk about the chlamydia. And the chlamydia are small gram-negative, again, intracellular parasites. And they have the ability to alternate between two different forms. We have what's known as the metabolically inactive form or the elementary body. And this elementary body can evolve into the active form known as the reticulate body. And the reticulate body grows within host cell vacuole. So Chlamydia trachomatis is the major member of this group that we will talk about. There's two strains that can infect humans. We have the trachoma strain, which goes after the mucous membranes of the eyes, the genital urinary tract, and the lungs. And we also have the LGV, lymphogranuloma venarium form, which invades the lymphatic tissues of the genitalia. So the chlamydial diseases of the eye include things like ocular trachoma, which may result in um, eye deformations and cause blindness, and then conjunctivitis, which occurs with uh, young children as they pass through the birth canal. We talk a lot about ophthalmia neonatorum, and this is prevented by prophylaxis. Chlamydia can also cause several STIs. Um, the major ones are things like chlamydiosis, which is a very prevalent STI, causing long-term reproductive damage. More asymptomatic in females than in males. And the non-gonococcal urethritis, which has very similar symptoms to Neisseria gonorrhea, or the gonococcal urethritis that we've talked about in previous chapters, causing that inflammation of the urethra. Oftentimes, when these, again, your urinary tract often does not have any microbes associated with it. However, if bacteria are able to ascend up the urinary tract, we get these much more severe secondary conditions like pelvic inflammatory disease. And this can get in and damage things like the fallopian tubes in females, causing a, a condition known as salpingitis, which leads to infertility. And then obviously we have the lymphogranuloma venarium, which causes a disfigurement to the external genitalia and can also cause damage to the lymph nodes uh, in the lymphatic system. Remember that your lymphatic system drains into these little bean-shaped structures called your lymph nodes, and that uh, lymphonoma, lymphogranuloma can actually damage that lymphatic system in your pelvic region. So how do we identify chlamydia? Well, we do a sampling from cells that have dislodged from the mucosal surfaces of these various tracts. We use a probe test to determine uh, if there are those microbes present. And there are different stains, iodine stains being some of the big ones that look for um, conjunctivitis as well, the organisms that cause conjunctivitis. We also talk about Chlamydemophila and Chlamydemophila pneumoniae uh, causes a atypical pneumonia that's extremely serious in um, asthma patients. So in most patients, it causes a very mild illness um, and respiratory in nature. There's also connections of clammy demophila uh, to arteriosclerosis, which causes damage to the heart. Clammy demophila 
causes ornithosis, which is a uh, disease that's transmitted to humans from bird vectors, and it's extremely uh, communicable among birds. So you get this flu-like infection, uh, pneumonia, and fever. We also talk about the cell wall deficient bacteria. And these are known as the mycoplasmas. And the reason why they're cell wall deficient is they lack a cell wall. Treatment with normal antibiotics, like the cell wall drugs, the penicillins, are ineffective against this group because they don't have the cell wall. There's no peptidoglycan present. Mycoplasma pneumoniae is the most common one, and it causes this atypical or walking pneumonia where the pathogen slowly spreads uh, over the respiratory surfaces, causing fever and chest pain and sore throat to occur. Um, we also talk a lot about mycoplasma genitalium and urea plasma urealyticum, which are both uh, sexually transmitted infections. We also talk a lot about the L forms. So when we talk about bacteria that have lost their cell walls, exposure to certain types of drugs or enzymes can cause what's known as the L form to occur. And this happens spontaneously. Now, we're gonna get into our ending today is gonna to look at bacteria that are associated with uh, dental diseases. And we're going to talk, obviously, about gingivitis. We're also going to talk about dental caries and periodontal disease. So most dental diseases involve the teeth and the surrounding structures, known as the gingiva, the ligaments, and the membrane bone, which form the periodontum. Um, when we talk about dental caries, we talk a lot about the grooves in the enamel. And one of the big questions that always comes up is uh, we see less cases of dental caries uh, for patients that are 65 or older, so less cavities. And that's because a lot of these grooves and channels in the teeth actually dissipate as you get older. So most of the damage that you're going to see um, from microbes to folks who are elderly are... Uh, periodontal damage, where the actual bone structure or the gums have receded and the teeth are lost from the mouth region. So again, we have our tooth structure that we're going to look about, and we also have these structures underneath that are supporting the tooth in place, including things like the gingiva, this pink layer here, or the what we know as the gum. So most of the dental pathology is gonna to happen to the tooth surface. And dental caries are actually the most common infectious diseases in humans. The bacteria utilize not only their fimbriae to attach, but they also produce biofilms. And these biofilm layers ultimately over time generate products that lead to the tooth decay. So that's why it's really important to have regular dental checkups uh, to remove those biofilms from the surface of the teeth. Um, these, what we refer to as cariogenic bacteria, actually go through and ferment polysaccharides that are stored in granules. So when plaque becomes calcified into calculus uh, above and below the gingiva, this irritates the gum tissue, the gingiva, and causes what's known as gingivitis or an inflammation of the gums. And as this happens and the inflammation occurs, it opens up pockets between the tooth and the gum line that are then invaded by uh, all sorts of bacteria. Streptococcus mutans being one of the most common ones. And this tooth socket may now start to get inflamed, known as periodon peri periodontitis. And as that periodontitis occurs, this may weaken the structures holding the tooth in the socket, 
causing the tooth to be lost. So again, here's our, our tooth and our gingiva, and you'll notice that as the gingiva become inflamed, it opens up these pockets surrounding the tooth, which can allow um, microbes in and causing deeper damage to these supporting structures, ultimately uh, allowing the tooth to fall out of the socket. Um, I do want to mention in closing that a lot of the treatments for this include things like flossing regularly to clear out any of these deposits that are forming in these pockets. Um, oftentimes brushing can't reach down into these surfaces, so that's really important as well uh, to help minimize and prevent a lot of these infections from occurring. So thanks everybody for joining in. If you have questions on this as you watch the video and go through the slides, please feel free to pop into office hours this week. Thanks everybody.